Welcome to a special edition of NHK Newsline. I'm Kawasaki Rika in Tokyo. Today, March 11th, marks the 13th anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. Note this program will use images of tsunami as a reminder of the dangers of natural disasters. The magnitude 9 quake hit off the Pacific coast of Japan, shocking the country. It triggered massive tsunami that wiped out communities, leaving over 20,000 dead or missing. That includes those who later died due to circumstances caused by the disaster. It also led to one of the world's worst nuclear accidents. This year's anniversary comes just two months after another tragedy. The world watched as disaster struck the areas around the Noto Peninsula on New Year's Day. A series of quakes rocked central Japan, destroying homes and generating tsunami. It left over 200 people dead. It was yet another reminder that natural disasters can strike anywhere at any time. This hour, we'll be taking you live to Miyagi and Fukushima as the country observes a moment of silence. We'll also bring you the latest from the Noto Peninsula to look at not only what we lost, but what we learned since the disaster. We go first to Japan's Pacific coast. Since early this morning, many survivors have been grieving those who were lost. The people who are still missing may have been swept out to sea. I came to offer prayers for them. This man lost five members of his family, his wife, parents, brother, and nephew. He comes on the 11th day of every month to remember his relatives. Thirteen years have flown by since the earthquake. I wish my family was still alive. I'd like to think they're watching over those who survived. Suzuki Takeko was forced to evacuate when the disaster struck. She also lost her son that day. He went out to close the floodgate and was caught in the tsunami. The wave came when he went to check to see if an actual tsunami was coming. It happened in a flash. I can't forget the feeling at that moment. It will be with me for a long time. Like Suzuki, hundreds of thousands were forced to leave their homes. Even now, over 29,000 people still cannot return. We turn now to NHK World's Yamaguchi Hiroaki. He's in Kesennuma City, one of the areas hardest hit by the tsunami. Hiroaki. Rika, I'm standing in what used to be Kesennuma Koyo High School. It was devastated in the tsunami, but has since been preserved and turned into a museum. 300 meters away, to the east of the school, is the Pacific Ocean. It's not easy to see from here anymore because they have built a high seawall. Locals say when the tsunami hit, the area was destroyed in minutes. Fortunately, everyone at this school survived, but teachers uh, and teachers and students were able to evacuate to higher ground after the initial quake struck. The tsunami was estimated to have reached around 12 meters. You can see damage all the way up to the fourth floor and really get a sense of the sheer size of the waves. I'm in the former classroom. All around me, there's textbooks, furniture, and debris that swept in from outside. Everything has been left as it was. And to give you an idea of the destructive power of the tsunami, right here, there's a car that was pulled in by the water and crashed into the walls. So now as a museum, people can come here and experience the reality of the disaster. They get to think about how they might react to a similar situation in the future. We spoke to a few of them. Here's what they said. When I actually came here and saw the damage, I again felt fear and the power of tsunami. 
As long as I live, I want to pass on the lessons from the disaster to protect my loved ones. Hiroaki, it's shocking to think of a car actually drifting into the third floor. I can't even imagine ever being prepared for something like that. Yeah. Right. And although the people in the school survived, this wasn't the case for everyone living in this area. For people living along the coast, the strength and the height of the waves was too much. As you can see, there are few houses left standing in nearby Suginoshita district. Nearly a third of its residents were killed in the disaster. We learned of a group of residents that made it to higher ground, but it still wasn't high enough to escape the waves. Since 2011, local evacuation procedures have been adjusted. On top of that, residents here are taking steps to ensure future generations understand what happened. One of the things they do here is they tell stories. So elders, people that lost family members in the tragedy, even students, share details from that day. Please do not forget the memories. Please do not look away the facts. I think another disaster is most certainly going to occur. I don't know if it will happen while today's youth are still alive. But still, we must continue to pass on what we know about the disaster to the next generation. I want to convey what happened with intention and emotion to young people. All right, that's all from us for now, but I'll tell more about this place later on. Back to you, Rika. Thank you, Hiroaki. We'll hear from you again later on. We're now approaching 2.46 p.m., the exact time the earthquake struck. People across Japan are about to observe a moment of silence. As you heard earlier, Survivors say they have a responsibility to pass those lessons on to the next generation. Keeping that memory alive is a challenge for those who live through it. Now, these are live images coming in from the Tohoku area, which was hit especially hard by the tsunami. The country will now observe a moment of silence. That was the moment of silence to remember the lives lost in the massive earthquake and tsunami. These moments give people a chance to remember the past, but also think about our future. We're joined again now by Yamaguchi Hiroaki in Kesenuma. So Hiroaki, many natural disasters have struck since that day, including the New Year's Day quake in central Japan. What are people thinking about today? Rika. Many of the people here told us that the earthquake in Noto reminded them of what they went through 13 years ago. Although there's a great distance between the two places, residents here decided they wanted to do something for Noto survivors. So last night, the courtyard outside this facility featured a light display. The visual was arranged in the shape of a heart with wings. It's the city's way of expressing gratitude to the people of Noto which, like many parts of Japan, was quick to provide aid to residents here in the aftermath of 2011. 
Meanwhile, some in the Noto Peninsula say they've been inspired by the resilience of the Tohoku region. Now, as the recovery there continues, its hospitality industry is holding out hope for a tourism rebound. NHK World's Takahashi Naoya spoke to an owner in Suzu City choosing to persevere. Yamaguchi Yuka heads to work at Kinoula Village. She runs an inn that offers seaside cottages with a picturesque view of the Noto Peninsula's northern shore. The scenic vistas and a chance to go ocean kayaking brought in about 2,500 visitors last year. But then, on New Year's Day, the sea changed. The water's edge was right around here. It looks completely different. She was in the main building when the magnitude 7.6 quake struck. The glass windows in here shattered. The inside was wrecked, but the buildings stood strong, and no staff or guests were hurt. The facility opened as a shelter for people who lived nearby, but Yamaguchi says it will take a year to fully reopen to guests. She's not the only one struggling. Damage and the loss of running water has caused many businesses to shudder. Suzu is also dealing with an aging population, with over half of its residents 65 or older. Officials say keeping young business owners like Yamaguchi around is essential for the city to stay alive. The city would like to harness the power of young business owners and work with them to speed up Suzu's recovery. As a member of its younger generation, Yamaguchi already left once before. She was raised in Suzu and moved away for work. When she gave birth, she came back for her daughter to grow up closer to nature. But the life they built here will have to be rebuilt. Unlike Kinoula village, the house was devastated by the quake, and the family is now staying with relatives. However, Yamaguchi says remaining in Suzu is worth it. I know how good Suzu is. I think it is important that I spread that message and protect this area. She is driven by words from past guests eager to return. Those messages are very encouraging to me because I feel like they're very interested in us long term and are watching over us. She's also inspired by businesses that fought hard to reopen after a different earthquake 13 years ago. I heard a big part of the recovery from the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami relied on people supporting business owners who chose not to give up. I think it is the same here in Noto. This quake pushed both people and the sea farther away. But Yamaguchi and others are determined to keep working until the tide turns back in their favor. Takahashi Naoya, NHK World, Suzu. But Hiroaki, rebuilding can take years. Do people in Tohoku have any insight for those just at the starting line? Yes, Rika. And the 2011 disaster completely changed things here. And the people here, all net, uh, people here know that all too well. And that's why sending aid and volunteers to Noto was so important to them. Here's what the museum's vice director had to say on this. The support we got from other places was really helpful. Each and every one of them helped, and I felt the warmth of their hearts. This is why I have been feeling so grateful for their support ever since. I want to help minimize the casualties in disasters like this as much as possible. Rika, he stressed that improving evacuation procedures is necessary in saving lives, but getting people to think about their own survival in situations like this is also incredibly important. 
Back to you. One of the biggest reminders of that day is the ongoing decommission work at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. It's seen as key to the reconstruction efforts in Fukushima Prefecture. The facility was damaged in the wake of the earthquake and tsunami. Let's take a look at how the work is going and how we got here. On March 11, 2011, the tsunami led to a triple meltdown at the plant. Radioactive substances were released into the atmosphere, spreading both on land and offshore. More than 160,000 people were displaced, and over 20,000 of them have yet to return. Since then, the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, has been pumping water into the reactors to cool the molten fuel. But rain and groundwater is also seeping in. The operator began looking into safely releasing the water. First, the water is treated to remove most of the radioactive substances, but it still contains tritium. So it is then diluted with seawater to reduce the tritium levels to below one-seventh of the World Health Organization's guideline for drinking water. TEPCO has been storing all that water on site in these tanks, but there's over a thousand of them, and that's taking up space that could be used to store radioactive waste and fuel debris. The operator started its first release last August, over 12 years after the disaster. We expect the marine discharge of the treated water will be conducted in an even more transparent manner. The Japanese government will do its utmost to ensure this. Since then, it has carried out three more releases. The fourth release is now underway. The company is expecting to release around 30,000 tons of water this fiscal year. Tests conducted by TEPCO and the Japanese government have shown a maximum tritium concentration of 22 becquerels per liter, far below the WHO's 10,000 becquerel limit for drinking water. The International Atomic Energy Agency has continued to keep an eye on the operation and found it consistent with international safety standards. But a string of recent incidents on site has raised concerns. In October, two workers were temporarily hospitalized after being splashed with liquid containing radioactive substances. And last month, untreated water was found to be leaking from the plant's purification system. It's shaken some people's faith in the process. TEPCO has been a huge disappointment to us, the people of Fukushima Prefecture and the residents of Okuma. Now, officials are making plans to remove fuel debris from the reactors. But the operation was recently delayed for the third time. The company says it will take about 30 years to fully decommission the plant. As for what it's like in Fukushima Daiichi today, NHK World's Yoshikawa Ayano got a rare look inside the facility to see how it's going up close. The tour began right next to Reactor 1. A hydrogen explosion had severely damaged the building. As you can see in Reactor 1, there's still a lot of debris. TEPCO officials say they have begun building a cover to go over the site to prevent radioactive substances like dust from getting out. It needs to be done before they can remove used nuclear fuel from inside. They also need to remove it from Reactor 2. This building houses the equipment for that operation. But there's another problem. Fuel debris in the reactor also has to be removed. TEPCO plans to hold a trial run for that this autumn. 
All this began when the reactors were damaged by the March 11th earthquake and tsunami. Even though they were built over 10 meters above sea level, they were still flooded. This building is at the same height as the reactors. Dark marks still remain on the walls. There are traces of the tsunami here. It was about five meters high. Today, the biggest problem is where to store radioactive waste, including the fuel debris. Like now, water from the reactors is taking up precious space. Behind me, you can see the tanks that hold the treated water. There's over a million tons of it stored here. TEPCO hopes to empty and collapse at least some of them over the next fiscal year. The only way to do that is to get rid of the water. The first release just started at the end of February. TEPCO showed us their diluting facility. Seawater is pumped in through these huge pipes. Seawater is mixed with treated water here. However, it's a slow process. More contaminated water is constantly being created. On top of the water being used to keep the reactors cool, rain and groundwater are also seeping in. It will take many years to empty all the tanks. Releasing the treated and diluted water is just the first step. Actually, decommissioning the plant is expected to take around 30 years, and the world is watching. For those working here, there is still a long road ahead. And Ayano is in Fukushima again today. She joins us now to tell us more about her visit to the plant. So Ayano, what was it like inside? Rika, what surprised me most was how much was never fixed after the quake and tsunami. I'm in the town of Namie. This port is about six kilometers away from the plant. You can see it behind me. From the outside, reactor one still looks like I imagined it was the day of the accident. To be honest, at first, I thought little progress had been made. But there are some developments to report. Workers still have to wear some protective gear, but not the full body kind except in a few sections of the plant. Monitoring posts around the facility, all reports radiation levels have been going down over the years. But levels near the reactor buildings are still high. TEPCO officials sometimes, as a precaution, rushed us to leave certain spots even when we wanted to stay a little longer. I was only there for one day. I had to carry around a device that measures radiation exposure. Before leaving, my items had to be scanned to ensure they weren't contaminated. It's hard not to think about the roughly 4,500 people working to decommission the plant. Yes, and speaking of that decommission work, what's the biggest hurdle now? A major question is whether TEPCO will manage to remove fuel debris from the reactors. TEPCO wants to remove just a few grams from reactor 2 so that they can figure out how to store it. But that wire is already three years behind schedule. That's partly due to issues around accessing fuel debris. Once those issues are over, then the real challenge begins. There are more than 800 tons of fuel debris to take out. Right, as you said, a long road ahead, but also a lot of uncertainty. What about the residents near the plant? How are they feeling about all this? They think the decommission work is going slowly. They doubt the process will actually be finished on time. 
people tell me the area can't fully recover until the plant is decommissioned. Nearby residents had to flee when the accident happened, and not everyone can come back yet. Here in Namie, about 80% of the land is a difficult to return on. Many still can't live in their homes again. It's also important to mention other ongoing work. A short time ago, we saw police and firefighters searching the beach along here. They were looking for the remains of victims of the tsunami. So, Lika, all these years later, the situation in this area is improving, but there are still many issues too. Thank you, Ayano NHK World's Yoshikawa Ayano reporting from Namie, Fukushima Prefecture. For more about the future of the Fukushima region, we're joined by William McMichael. He's an associate professor at Fukushima University. Uh, he was living in the region when the disaster hit and has been working on programs to revitalize the area. Mr. McMichael, thank you for joining us today. So as someone who lives in Fukushima, how do you think the recovery is going? Well, the revitalization process has gone through very distinctive phases, with the first initial phase being all about, you know, the post-disaster recovery and giving aid to the victims. Well, then from there, we moved on to rebuilding infrastructure so people can come back to these areas. And now we've entered a pivotal stage where the primary focus is on revitalizing the lives of the people living in these communities and aiming for a higher standard of life and a more sustainable economic model, I guess, for all the people living here. And a big feature, I think, right now of this phase is there's been a very, very focused effort to rejuvenate, you know, traditional industries and culture and try to integrate them together with new initiatives that have been introduced since uh, the disasters, such as renewable energy and robotics industry. And um, everywhere, really, around these areas, you'll find that there's so many, you know, new and young entrepreneurs who are taking on this challenge and coming with very, very innovative projects. And it's, it's very, very inspiring. And Fukushima and this area has really become a model, I think, a dynamic model for innovation and resilience that's very inspiring and motivates me to continue to do programs here. Thank you, Mr. McMichael. We will be back with you in just a few minutes. As he mentioned, people are also hoping to revive Fukushima's communities. That's also true in Okuma Town, where the pl power plant itself is located. All its residents were forced to flee, devastating the town's agricultural industry. But one newcomer is planting seeds of hope for a revival. NHK World's Ueno Yamato shows us how. One underway. 100 more to go. Abe Shotaro is turning this field into a kiwi orchard. <laughs> He's working on this in Okuma, a town that used to be famous for orchards that produced kiwis and pears. But many orchards were cleared due to the contamination work, which included replacing all of the soil. This had a major impact on the town's agriculture. Many areas remain blocked off. Residents, including farmers, weren't sure when they could return. According to the town, about 1,100 people live here now. The population has dropped by 90% since 2011. Abe learned the history of Okuma for his university club in Tokyo. He visited the town for the first time four years ago and interviewed residents who used to live in peace, just like him. Abe created a booklet to preserve memories of the accident. There are lots of people who still don't know about the situation in Okuma. Some of them don't even know its name. I hope this will help people to learn more about the town. After finishing the project, he took a year off from university and moved closer to Okuma to learn more. 
I've heard from residents that fruits were the pride of the town. That inspired him to grow kiwis. No one else will do it, so I feel I should do it. I will do my best to contribute to society in my own way. He thinks by selling okuma grown fruit, he will bring attention to the town. So Abe rented fields and began planting in February. Problem is, he has no farming experience. But he does have support, including from farmers who used to grow fruit in Okuma. Saeki Akira is helping too. The Fukushima University researcher has been studying agriculture in the disaster-affected areas. Okuma has lost its agricultural workers, so it's very important for the town to have young people come here and start new farming. Abe is getting more people involved, including his friends. Locals are also coming out to support him, even getting their hands dirty. I am so happy that they are doing something good for my community. I think having people from outside the community work here on this farm with local residents will help them learn more about the town and become interested in it. It will take two years before Abe can start harvesting, but through his efforts, he's already making a difference. Ueno Yamato, NHK World, Okuma, Fukushima Prefecture. We're joined again now by Associate Professor McMichael from Fukushima University. So we've been talking a lot about local initiatives in Fukushima, but the world has also been watching. Uh, what do you make of the role of international community here? Well, uh, speaking to residents here, I think a lot of people want the international community to better understand and support our revitalization journey. And there's many things that uh, people living, you know, uh, outside of Japan can do to support Fukushima. You know, you could buy local products that are available around the world, or even something as simple as maybe sharing a story about Fukushima to, you know, uh, remind people what's going on here online is great. Or, or perhaps even join some of the organized educational tours we're creating here for people to understand Fukushima the next time you're visiting Japan. Things like that will be great. And I think it's really paramount to raise more awareness that Fukushima's issues and problems are not just isolated issues that are just about Fukushima or Japan. They're actually quite, you know, uh, related and they resonate with global issues, uh, you know, such as uh, sustainable energy choices, building resilient communities, and fostering, you know, more leaders to better tackle, I guess, community issues like depopulation of rural communities, for example. And just um, raising awareness of the fact that we're interconnected is, is very crucial. And for Fukushima to do that on our side, I think it's also important that we continue to make it more accessible for people to come here and make it a lot more easier to understand the situation. So you've been there for these 13 long years, which means you've seen it all. So what do you feel yes. still needs to be done? Well, obviously, over the past 13 years, there's been a lot of progress made. Uh, for example, the recent uh, diluted, uh, sorry, treated and diluted water, the release of that, and gaining international understanding for the reasons of releasing that into the ocean. That was a huge, significant step forward. But what needs to be acknowledged is there's many, many more pivotal steps ahead, uh, with each step actually becoming more and more challenging, I feel, as we move towards our overarching goal of uh, decommissioning the nuclear power plants, for example, and freeing this area of this uh, shadow that is, the decommissioning process has really cast. And um, as we navigate these uncharted waters, I really feel it's important, though, that the focus of the revitalization is always, always, always centered on the people living here and the lives of the people here. And that, that fact is never forgotten when any decisions are made. I think that's a really important uh, thing that we need to remember, not just in Fukushima, but also around the world as well. Thank you for your insight. That was Mr. William McMichael from Fukushima University. As we've seen, it will likely take many years for the wounds from that day to heal. NHK World will continue to bring you stories from the affected regions as they walk the long road to recovery. However, it's important to remember that disaster can strike anywhere, anytime. 
For what to do in an emergency, we recommend checking NHK's Bosai website. The name Bosai is the Japanese term for disaster preparedness. The website offers various tips and best practices in the event of earthquakes, tsunami, typhoon, or heavy snow. For example, this video explains what to do if a major earthquake strikes while you're at Narita Airport. NHK will be updating the site with additional content and regional information, so please take a look. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of NHK Newsline. Today we heard from those living in the Tohoku region and beyond as they mark the anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. We'll have more coverage on this throughout the day, so please stay with us. We leave you now with these scenes from today's moment of silence. I'm Kawasaki Rika in Tokyo. Thank you for joining us. あの、過ごしてきた時間が、あの、少しでも何か前向きな、あのことに生かされればいいなとは思ったり。忘れないで伝える。命だけは大切にしてもらいたい。他人事ではなくて、いつ自分に起きてもおかしくないっていう感じで